My name is Patrick J. Jones. I'm an author, an artist, and a teacher. We are going to explore the drawing of the female figure in fantasy art. We are going to explore what I consider the pencil equivalent of oil paints on canvas, and that is charcoal on newsprint. Within this workshop, we will draw a few rendered drawings, but most of the mileage is going to come from the starts. We're going to start lots of drawings and not necessarily finish them. Most of the life in the drawing is within the first few strokes. And after that, it's an uphill battle to recreate and reinvigorate the drawing with further gestural lines because we fall into the necessary trap of structure, which is to make it look solid. As an introduction, there are very similar themes that we're going to revisit over and over. And structure and gesture is the king of all of that. We have to master both to get a balance that reads as a figure that's alive, but not stiff, and a figure that's fluid, but not jello. And therein lies the rub. It's the fight of all artists throughout the ages. How do we make this thing look alive and at the same time make sure that it reads as a lifelike solid thing? Now look at the lovely display of those fingers. That is a gestural moment between fingers going one, two, three, four. That's a rhythm. And rhythm and gesture are very closely linked. They are in everything. In music, in the beats of a story, and most of all within figure drawing. Figure drawing is the hardest discipline of all. We have all these rhythms in nature, and landscape painters do beautiful work with that idea. But when we choose the figure, we have chosen the hardest thing in the world to draw. Or, as I like to think of it, the most interesting thing in the world to draw. Because the possibilities are endless. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement all of that stuff we just looked at and try and make this a joyous affair, but with thought being encumbered by the reference. You might think it's strange to hear that the reference is an encumberment, but it is. We see reference and we think, if we don't get it the same as the reference, then we've made a mistake. We haven't done our job right. Remember, art shouldn't be ticking boxes. It should be joyous. If it's not, then your art will look like it's not. I often say that if you draw when you're bored, your art will be boring. If you draw when you're tired, your art will look tired. We have drawn with all the enthusiasm that can be garnered using gesture and the gestural hand here and the holistic nature of the figure. And now we can move down this body knowing that having plotted out the entirety of it, we can move from side to side and draw as we start it with in streams of consciousness but with more idea of what the forms are going down the body. Art is not like anything else. It's different. It'll be filled with contradictions, but when you look closer, they're not really contradictions. I am still using the method of one side to the other, holistic vision, a tube shape, a big broad gesture for the twist of the hips all the way down to the leg, and move in over with the streams of consciousness idea. And the more you draw, the less you'll have to draw and measure at the same time. Because I don't think it's that important. It is to begin with, but not later. Do your due diligence in the background. Draw many standard figures and measure them until you get really handy at that. And then in the background, keep drawing this. And say that that navel's too high, and it is, but it doesn't matter. 
because the joy supersedes everything. Confidence supersedes all. No matter what errors I make, and there are none really, there's only errors if that navel goes above that ribcage. It's still in the ballpark. And also, I'm only glancing at that reference. I'm not studying it. Notice my hand has barely left that page at any point for me to step back and measure. This isn't how you draw everything. It could be detrimental, it would be, to a, a long finished drawing. Or what the world sees as a finished drawing, a very rendered drawing. But for this beautiful little moment of joy, it's perfect for this. I have already plotted out the basic size. And once again, you can add another proportion to this. Let's say the great trochander is halfway down the figure. And the bottom of the knees is the other quarter from that. So we've got three measurements. Or, as I like to do with the female figure, go from the top of the head to the navel, and then to the top of the knees, down to the foot, and we'll get thirds. And that's a nice little measurement that I use quite a lot. And easy to see it on the female figure, because from the back, we pinch in at that point too, on the 12th rib, with the navel being the equivalent on the back of the 12th rib, the end of the rib cage. The rib cage has 10 ribs on the front and 12 at the back, that's why it's lower. And we can always find out where the rib cage is. It always makes itself known, especially on the female figure. And we can always find the hips on the male figure because it stops immediately at the obliques. A little trickier on the female figure. So the female figure, I look for the curve in of the rib cage. On the male figure, I look for the curve out of the obliques against the hips. But I talk a lot about the destructive nature of photo reference. As for now, what I want you to do is think about the joy of not being wedded to it for many reasons, and one of them being distortion. And we can distort our drawings any way we please, as long as the artistic hand reads that way. What I'm drawing here is shorthand for a lot of complicated muscles. That straight is the pollicis muscles, that curve is the brachial radialis longus coming around there. And if we draw lots, that will make sense to us. But of all the muscles in the arm, the brachial radialis is the most important one to remember how it overlaps from the lower arm to the upper arm and how it has that big curve run to work that thumb. So a massive big muscle that is seen from the top side of the arm and also from the underside. So it's the biggest player in the arm. Note how the leg comes inwards at that angle. Another thing that I'm well aware of, and I use that moment to put a straight on it. And that stops the jello nature of the gestural lines throughout the figure. Once we have that straight on there, everything solids up, everything becomes this magical gestural, though also structural shape. And look how I haven't adhered to the reference I put the legs together. I like the quirky nature of the toes going in there. Maybe I'll use it in a different drawing. But for this one I had a, an idea of a sense of a little bit more balance but going slightly off kilter. I wanted a figure in motion. I didn't add the ponytail for instance. And the reason I mention any of this is that we are not slaves to the reference. We use the reference to find our moment in time as artists and knowing when to stop on a little drawing like this is actually a tricky business. And I'm slowing down to a crawl here almost as far as a quick drawing goes to ask myself, is there any more to be said here? And if there's not, then it's time to think about stopping. I did think it needed a little overlap there from the tendons of the pectoralis because they do overlap the arm from the front. And I felt that it helped with the dimension, because there's less dimension when there's less render. Remember that. And the way to create dimension with line is to overlap it. And so I've overlapped those lines, and now we can tell that one thing's in front of another. And by putting a heavier dark on that, further reinforces that idea as well. I finish as I start it which is to regain the holistic nature of it. 
and just look over the whole drawing and see what needs a tweak here or there without render, without going too far into the process of explaining everything that's in the photo in the drawing. People will forgive a photograph with all its awkwardness, but they won't forgive a drawing because every line you've put there belongs to you. It was your thought. So let's leave with that idea that every line should be a thought. So I look forward to seeing you again in the next workshop, exploring further this world of the fantasy female figure. How to bring story into your art, how to grow the art, and how to fuel the art all the way through with a passion. How to draw the fantasy female figures is presented in 14 parts. In these workshops, we'll take it right back to the basics. We'll start with very simple ideas. Ideas that can be broken into big shapes and fit smaller shapes into them. When it comes to tricky business like the forearm and hand, I'll slow the process down and show you my methods. The fact that you'll be drawing along and listening to all my thoughts, all my iterations, will make you a stronger artist. We'll learn how to draw from imagination and find in the gesture, in everything, in the hair, eyebrows, as you draw along, you too will imbibe these methods and draw with more confidence throughout your art career. We'll draw torsos from imagination and understand mnemonics, how the figure flows, how the parts connect, it's like the mermaid's tail. We'll also learn to deal with an idea that's rarely discussed, and that's how to come out of a disastrous drawing and make it work. What's commonly known as failure. For me, it's just another way to go forward. So this course will build your confidence to approach any drawing and make it work. These methods I've honed over a lifetime, and I've distilled them into simplicity. You too can draw from imagination with great confidence. This course is perfect for everyone, the concept artist, the fine artist, the figurative artist. Whether it's a hobby or a profession, we'll learn from these 14 hours of how to draw the fantasy female figure.